So it is my absolute pleasure to welcome Catherine Lowry. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Emma. Um, well, how exciting to be together, eh? I just think that's just so wonderful. And when I was outside at morning tea, just to hear all the conversations and to actually think, wow, this is what connection is all about. It's just so good. Zoom is great for various things, but nothing really beats coming together and sharing experiences and catching up about what's happening and, and talking about, um, you know, what did you do during lockdown? I spoke with someone yesterday who said that they um, discovered how to make terrariums. So that's her new hobby. So I think, you know, there are many things that have come out of this. Some things good and other things maybe more challenging. But it's such a pleasure to be here and to share this day with you. So I'd like to um, begin by acknowledging the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation and to um, pay my respects to Elders past, present and emerging and to recognise the strength, resilience and capacity of Aboriginal people in this land. Today I'm going to spend um, some of my time talking about the updated strategy for mental health reform that the Commission spent most of 2019 and into 2020 working on. It's called Living Well in Focus and this is what it looks like and the lovely Katrina has been outside with copies and if you want a copy and we run out we'll absolutely mail some out to you. That's no problems with that. There's more back at the ranch as they say. So I was just, was just going to say um, about the cover. So the cover um, tells the story and the cover is done by a woman from um, Bungjalung land, so that's up north coast. And I just want to tell you what um, Leanne Hall um, has said about her art, which is, the painting tells the story of going back to country and making our way to the ceremony to reconnect with our clan. People come from all directions and there are many pathways that will take you back to country. This sacred journey enriches the soul and brings a renewed energy into the people and community. Um, Leanne has her own lived experience and has reflected upon that in her art. And I think over the past year, we have learned much about what can be achieved via Zoom or remote technology. But I think when we come together again like today, from many directions and many different countries, we are reminded of the deep and nourishing connections that are formed when we meet together to share stories and support one another. And so I would also like to acknowledge the lived experience of people recovering from mental distress and to those who offer them support and hope. As you know, the Mental Health Commission of New South Wales is committed to guiding New South Wales towards full recognition of the rights of people whose lives are affected by mental health issues in the way from stigma and discrimination. And I especially would like to thank Bean and Irene, wherever Irene is, um, Irene Gallagher and um, Ryan DeLima and the Mental Health Peer Workforce Committee for the invitation to speak with you today. The peer workforce, probably more than any other workforce, are really the Commission's allies in reform, and it's always an honour to be able to meet with you and to discuss how we can, you know, change the world. Someone's already said, well, we already had our discussion about how to change the world, and I think peer workforce is really that, that extra additional change to how we can change the world. Change the world for ourselves, change the world for the community, change the world for the people that we work with. And even on that system level, then lifting that and amplifying that so we can change how systems work together, how they work for each other and how they work for the person who actually needs their support in their own recovery. So I'll talk a little bit about living well in focus. So. We spent over 18 months travelling around New South Wales and it was a bit about, I've been everywhere, man. Is this going to work? It's not going to work for me now. Ah. So, 
Many of you may have come to our consultations. We did 60 consultations across New South Wales. Um, we sat around Laminax tables in Aboriginal communities. We went to schools. We went to clubhouses. We went to services. Um, we held forums like this. We had an online survey. And the issue we really wanted to know was five years into Living Well, which was um, released in 2014, how was it going? Had it made a difference? What were the challenges that were still being experienced? And what did we really need to focus in on? If you remember, Living Well had over 140 actions, and that was a lot of work that really, in one sense, bedded down the groundwork for reform. So we were really interested to know what should we focus on in the next five years that will then end out that 10-year period of reform. So we went travelling and did a lot of listening and um, it was such an invaluable experience. So as I said, I cannot thank um, each and every one of you who would have attended one of our forums or gone onto our online survey because our work couldn't have been done without you. So on our website, if you do want to go and see what, um, what we did, we've got a web page and um, when we travelled around New South Wales, we looked at each of the PHNs as a piece of geography, a region. And there's um, one PHN page and it will, you'll see what we did, you'll see what the stats were, you'll see what good case studies we found in that community. Um, there's a video of a particular case study. So they're resources that are all for you to go back and look at or use and share. So saying that, we also have, um, when we were travelling around, we did some wonderful, um, well, we did some videos of some wonderful peer work um, practices, initiatives and programs. And one of them was the Kempsey Peer Work Project. And I think that's going to play. So I'll let you watch that and enjoy that. The Kempsey Peer Worker Project is a collaboration between Family and Community Services and the Mid-North Coast Mental Health Service. It's basically about a peer worker being co-located and kind of when we were thinking about it, about having them embedded within both services. The minute I saw the job placement, I knew exactly that it was meant for me. I've had my own lived experience um, with um, the mental health system and my journey has been part of who I am now I guess and I knew that um, I had something to offer others that were on their way. I don't know where I'd be without it to be honest. Probably no better off than I was when I first um, entered the mental health facility before I was linked up with her. I had a lot of issues going on, homelessness, miscontact with my children. I didn't have a licence, I didn't know what services or programs to it's good that she knew how to navigate the system and link me up with the right people for that to happen. Definitely she has for me, she helped me obtain housing, get my driver's license, contact with my children. There's been a lot she's done for me in the past 12 months. She's got a lot of understanding and she's very supportive and it makes me feel better knowing that she speaks from experience herself as well. She understands the complexity of mental illness and what it means to stay well. We did a bit of a literature review and we were actually trying to see if, is this something that has been put in place elsewhere and what can we learn from that. But for, from our knowledge we, we couldn't find anything that had actually been about making one peer worker work across both services. People have just kind of really relished having Jo as part of the team to be able to bring that um, empathy and, and perspective in, but also she's very practical and she's very knowledgeable in particular areas, so it's actually enhanced the case manager's knowledge um, about the systems outside of mental health, so about the facts systems, she's been able to really um, enhance that with the staff. To be invited into you know, team meetings or part, to be part of family action plans to give my peer perspective has, has been um, very empowering for myself um, and just, uh, 
you know, I think that's all new area for, for some of the, the fax case managers, but they've just been so welcoming and um, supportive. I kept asking Joe when we were driving out to them back ahead, so what is it again you do? And then the, and she said, I'm a peer worker, you know, I've had lived experiences. And I said, well, what does that mean? Um, and then when she started to trust me, she explained it and, I, and the penny actually dropped. And, and because it's been so beneficial, I, I was thinking, how could something like you in our office make such a difference? And, and Jazz, we've got this thing between us. She said, Sue, it's not rocket science. And I say, well, it is. Good enough is not good enough. We have to do better. And introducing joint roles like this where we could go out together and not be a battle because we share resources, we share knowledge, we share the same passion for, for our families. It, it works really well. It's a really good formula. So a big shout out to Nick, who's just going to casually sit there and, you know. But I think it just really shows that um, peer work can be empowering. And in that case, when we went up to um, Kempsey and we found that, you know, it was a unique initiative, that you just think it's just awesome that in terms of the work and the opportunity that peer work can bring to work across services, between services, and again, Work with another workforce, you may not get peer work. So you're also leveraging that change, you know, and, and for me it really resonates that saying that, you know, we are the change that we wish to see. So, you know, we can be those change agents um, wherever we work. So I, I don't need to kind of really retell you what that was about, but I just think it just shows that um, the way that when we really focus on a person's holistic needs and the way that that peer work um, initiative and um, Joe's role in that has really bridged understandings but it really you know for that um, young woman made such a difference to have someone who was there with her through the steps and I think that's just such an invaluable um, initiative and I know that's what you do in in your work and I think how we can still grow and reimagine um, where peer work can have its impact and its effect. So in southwestern Sydney, we also heard about the Peer Supported Transfer of Care Initiative. So um, I don't know whether Ashley Reynolds is here, but um, you know, again, another shout out. Um, her and the team were supporting the personal recovery of people with mental health issues as they transition between inpatient and community care and providing the support people are connected to the information, knowledge, resources and services they need to live well. And the consumer workers are empowering people with lived experience to be active participants in their own recovery. In Northern Sydney, we heard about the Hearing Voices Group, which I know many of you are involved in running in your districts. The program operates in four areas of Northern Sydney and since its inception in 2010, um, We've been, it's been delivered 27 times and a total of 114 people have been engaged. And I just think that, um, you know, there are so many different ways that we can see peer um, experience being absolutely in services in different ways that are responsive to their local community and their local community needs. So one last video, the Orange Peer Work Project um, Nicole and the team are working across inpatient units to provide peer support to consumers and provide education to staff. And here, Nicole and Gordon talk about the magic of peer work. There's a certain certain thing that happens when you connect with someone as a peer worker, when you say, you talk about the, the fact that you understand that and your lived experience and touch on that, there, there's just a look that, that you have with them that's a moment of connection and I think that that's, that's been really special for all of us. We've all had those, those moments when you, you really feel helpful, you really feel connected and you feel like you, you've got them, you've got them. 
So the Peer Work Approach project aims to have peer workers accessible to uh, inpatients at Bloomfield Hospital, as well as educating staff about the lived experience. So this is a partnership between Mission Australia and, and the local health district. There's eight peer workers, including a senior peer worker, who are all allocated to a ward. However, we have a lot of flexibility around the program and they're able to work in different wards uh, at different times because we want to be responsive to people's needs. And we know that you know, peer work's really about um, engaging with somebody or, or talking to somebody that you connect with. So we want to have the flexibility to make that happen. In the Peer Work Approach project, there's a senior peer worker uh, in the emergency department, in the child and adolescent mental health ward, in our statewide rehabilitation units, in adult acute and in the Macquarie unit and also in older person's mental health. I guess it was a new thing for everybody having the peer worker but she settled in beautifully and her roles kind of evolved as the 12 months have gone on. She's really a huge part of our multidisciplinary team. She attends our handovers, case review meetings, and does a lot of work with the young people. Um, she's also run focus groups and things with young people and carers to help us enhance our program. And then she does individual work with young people and carers as well as helping to inform the team. So yeah, the beauty I guess of her role is that she spends all of her time on the floor with the young people and carers and she's involved in their journey from, from referral right through to discharge and in some cases actually does follow up with the young people and carers once they're discharged from the unit. They're quicker to tell their story now with her present, they're quicker to kind of talk about what's going on for them and what they might need to help them so I think certainly enhance their recovery and their clinical outcomes as a result of having her in our service, yeah. In May last year, the 25th, uh, my wife catastrophically passed away with streptococcus septus. So yeah, she had, in four days she passed away. So, And then it was a struggle for me. I become self-harming. I didn't want to be around. Uh, what I did was I uh, went and see my psychologist and said, well, I need to admit myself into hospital because I don't think I'll be around here much longer while I'm going, so. And a lot of friends and people said that was a good idea. So I come to hospital and when I did get here, they were gonna throw me in this little isolation booth and I cracked up a massive stick. I said, you're not throwing me in that, no way. You know, not the way I'm feeling. And that's when I met Nicole, my peer worker. And she sort of calmed me down. They took me to another uh, section of the hospital. She calmed me down. She said, now listen here, are you hungry? I said, yeah, I am actually. She sort of treated me like a, a normal human being, you know, that wanted to be. And she snuck off and got me a couple of sandwiches and a drink. And then we got talking and then they were able to coax me back into that room where they needed to take bloods and monitor me. We'd have conversation. It was like having a conversation with a friend, or going to a pub and having a beer. And just, but we'd have a coffee, or we'd have a cup of tea, or a drink. You know, people didn't know what peer work was. What do they do? How do they do it? And we, we actually often talk about, it's not what a peer worker does, but it's why. Why does a peer worker do it? Because when you change that question around from a what to a why, it makes it really interesting. It makes the answer really interesting. And we've talked a lot about actually uh, not advocating for, but advocating with people. We're really trying to focus on language at the moment as well um, and, and change it from, you know, our clients. Well, they're not yours, they don't belong to you. Um, but, and our patients, they're not yours. But how can we support them and how can we make that language really strengths-based? I think that that groundwork is done by the peer workers while we're in the hospital. So we can connect more meaningfully because we've spent more time talking with somebody um, is important to the consumer. They actually feel heard and understood and it's a personal connection. Some people will be readmitted over and over again, but I'm finding that um, the people that we see who have that bit of connection back out in the community and that understand where all the, the help is, um, they, they're not you know, presenting as much. I think a lot of it is about uh, loneliness and fear. Um, and you know, once they have other sort of mechanisms in place, they don't need to present back into the hospital as frequently. I, feel, I think that we all at various times have reflected about the, it's quite an honour to be allowed to be so close to somebody at their most vulnerable. Yeah, and none of us take that for granted at all.
So definitely we've all changed. With Nicole and everybody else behind me, I could become a peer worker and help. That's what I want to do, try and help someone. I know I've lost my wife and I'll always have that thought and she'll always be there, but it gives me something. My mind will be active and gives me something to do and I can help, if I can help someone, that's something like Nicole's helped me, so yeah. And when I look at that video, I actually think of each and every one of you in the room. That's what you do. You support people. You let them walk their recovery journey. What a powerful thing it is. And I'm, you know, I sometimes get really overwhelmed at the power of that human connection using your experience. So thank you. So I'm just going to finish up by saying in Living Well in Focus, we have a uh, whole chapter actually on um, lived experience. And we really try to not only amplify, but elevate where lived experience should be in our reform journey. So we've said that the peer workforce is growing and developing mature models of support to ensure sustainability and flexibility across the system. Peer workers are integral to the concept of lived experience at all service levels, including peer support to people with mental health issues and carers, peer mentoring and peer leadership. People with a lived experience of a mental health issue have a major contribution to make in policy development and research, and should be part of all workforces that deliver services to client groups with a significant number of people who experience mental health issues in any role where their skills apply. In particular, it was heartening to hear and see the increased commitment across the mental health system to engage with people with lived experience of a mental health issue and see the growth of peer workforce positions in acute and rehabilitation mental health facilities. So Living Well in Focus has 24 actions for mental health reform. And action 11 stipulates that the government agencies are to continue to build the consumer peer workforce and develop an agency strategy to guide these efforts. We heard from community members who advocated for peer worker support for people lived experience of a mental health review, oh, sorry, lived experience of a mental health issue at the Mental Health Review Tribunal and local courts. So Action 18 calls for a forensic peer workforce to increase opportunities for recovery for people under a forensic order. There's a slight difference now as we move on to where's the next step in this journey. I don't know whether any of you, after the launch of Living Well in 2014, may have thought, all those actions, what happened to them? I didn't see anything. I know I did. So what we've done now is we've changed how the Commission is going to be reporting against Living Well in Focus. So over the next five years, we're going to be making five public progress reports. So at the end of this year, we're going to have um, the first year that will be about a bit uh, how our agencies responding to those actions and how they're going to plan to implement them. In year three, we're going to have a, a mid-term kind of catch-up report and see how progress is going. And then in the last year, we'll be having a final report on progress. And I think that's really important for the Commission, not only to keep the government accountable, but to have you being able to have trans, um, you know, transparency into that process. We can't have accountability unless we have information, and I think that will be, for us, a real game changer. There's a lot of money that's invested. Tonight, the mental health budget amongst the state government's budget will be announced. So I think we'll all have our eyes on where are they going to invest? Are they going to focus on peer work? Are they going to focus on community-based services? And I know the Commission will have its eye there as well. So I really want to thank you for the invitation for being able to share a little bit with you about Living Well in Focus, but also to just say we so appreciate all the engagement, communications, emails, um, your participation in our consultations. It makes a difference to us. And as you know, for the Commission, lived experience is at the heart of what we do. It's in our DNA, and we can't do that without you. So thank you very much.